Okay, I guess that uh, we can uh, restart. I see that uh, many came back into the window. So let me uh, welcome Emi Nakamura, our second uh, keynote speaker. Uh, a short introduction of Emi. She's a Chancellor's Professor of Economics at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she's a, a both an, a research associate and co-director of the Monetary Economics uh, Program uh, of the MBR and co-editor of the American Economic Review. Uh, we all know Amy's work. Uh, she's uh, hugely influential uh, in macroeconomics, and for that she also received many awards. Uh, for example, the John Bates Clark Medal for her uh, influence on economic thought. Um, I'm not going to uh, summarize here the contribution of Amy. I guess that the best is actually to leave the floor to her for her presentation. Uh, let me just uh, um, uh, uh, say that the title of the presentation is The Slope of the Phillips Curve. Uh, uh, evidence from U.S. Uh, states, and this is joint work with Jonathan Nazel, Juan Erreño, and John Steinson. Amy, the floor is yours. You have 35 minutes. Uh, in the meanwhile, people will put uh, post uh, a question in the chat, and I will read them at the end of your presentation for the QA session. Please proceed. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, gracious introduction, and it's great to be here. Um, you know, if only virtually, it's 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 really nice to see these kinds of events continuing and and in fact increasing as we're all sort of recovering from the COVID crisis. So let me share my screen. Um, so um, this presentation is um, is joint as it's based on joint work with Joe Hazel, um, Juan Jaraño, and John Steinson. Um, so Joe and Juan were two of our former graduate students. Um, now. Um, at LSE and UCSD, respectively, and you know, if you if you haven't met them yet, I would certainly recommend doing that. Um, let me also say that I, I know that everybody in this audience is extremely knowledgeable about the topics that I'm I'm talking about, so I very much encourage your your questions and comments. So the topic of this paper is the slope of the Phillips curve, something that, as I said, I know that so many of you are intensely knowledgeable about. Uh, so let me move fairly briefly through through this introductory portion. Uh, so, so there are many formulations of the Phillips curve, uh, but here's one formulation. Um, this is the New Keynesian Phillips curve. On the left-hand side, we have inflation as a function of expected future inflation, um, and 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 then the gap between unemployment and the natural rate. So this is reflecting some kind of measure of um, of the output gap or of demand shocks. And then finally, there's this new term which reflects cost push shocks. Uh, so this is talking about these various, you know, drivers of, of inflation that, that, that are sort of central in, in the literature, the role of expectations, the role of demand shocks, and finally, the role of cost per shocks. Now, this presentation is going to be trying to think about this object, kappa, um, the slope of the Phillips curve, which is the response of inflation to demand shocks. So loosely speaking, how much does an increase in aggregate demand affect inflation? I think that the episode that has probably affected most American economists' views about the slope of the Phillips curve the most is the Volcker disinflation. So during um, the uh, early 1980s, uh, Paul Volcker dramatically raised interest rates. This was associated with a big recession. Unemployment rose dramatically and inflation fell dramatically. And so many people have interpreted this as pretty strong evidence of a steep Phillips curve. And, and this is you know, the way that this is often taught in intermediate macroeconomics classes. But relative to at least this interpretation of the Volcker disinflation, the period since the 1990s has looked sort of like a sequence of puzzles uh, in the sense that we've, 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 see, we've appeared to see a much more muted response of inflation to unemployment. So, uh, for example, during the Great Recession, we saw an increase in the unemployment rate that was comparable to the magnitude of the increase in the unemployment rate that happened during the, um, the Volcker period. And yet inflation, while it fell, fell by much less. Um, similarly, you could say that there was a missing reinflation in the aftermath of, um, of the Great Recession. As the economy recovered, unemployment fell very dramatically, um, but at the same time, um, we did not see a huge increase in inflation. Um, you know, not to say that inflation didn't show any cyclicality. Inflation certainly did fall a little bit during the Great Recession. 
and rose a little bit in the recovery, but it, it, it wasn't on the same order of magnitude as the changes in inflation that we saw um, around uh, the Volcker disinflation. I should, I should also, you know, apologize sort of at the outset, I'm, I'm speaking very much about the US experience. Um, and I know that at this conference, I have many um, people in the audience from Europe. But I do think that while I'm speaking specifically about things that have happened in the United States, the reality is, as, as many of you know, that that other countries, many other countries around the world have had similar experiences to the Volcker uh, disinflation. And I sort of encourage questions and discussions about how those experiences have played out uh, in other countries in the in the Q&A period. So this fact that there seems to be this contrast between um, less response of inflation to unemployment in uh, the last two decades relative to earlier is something that has uh, led to a pretty widespread discussion of the Phillips curve and macroeconomics. Um, you know, the question has been asked uh, many times whether the Phillips curve is getting flatter, whether it might be hibernating, whether it might just be completely dead. And, uh, and this observation um, has led to broader concerns about the Phillips curve as an analytical tool, whether perhaps um, this change in the slope of the Phillips curve might reflect some kind of an important flaw in the new Keynesian model. Uh, so while this, um, this idea of the Phillips curve flattening, I think is one of the main narratives um, that we have to talk about uh, the changes that have occurred uh, since 1990 or so in the US economy and, and also in various other economies, there is an alternative explanation one could think about for this set of facts. And this explanation has been emphasized uh, in particular by Bernanke uh, and Mishkin and by various others under the heading of uh, the anchored expectations hypothesis. So this is the idea that when Volcker came into office, it wasn't just that he raised interest rates and that this may have led to a decline in inflation through uh, the Phillips curve, but it's also clear that there were fundamental, uh, there was fundamental regime change that occurred at the Federal Reserve, and that this regime change may have affected uh, the people's long-term expectations about inflation. And then, in fact, these changes in people's long-term in, in inflation expectations may have, have played a crucial role in why inflation fell so much during the Volcker disinflation. So, from this perspective, you know, this offers perhaps. Um, you know, an, an, an interpretation of why the more recent period would look so different, because while there was clearly an important regime change that occurred around 1980 when, when Volcker came into office, things have been very different since the late 1990s when long run inflation expectations have been incredibly well anchored. Um, and this is, of course, also exactly the time period in which it's, it's, it's looked like inflation is so much less responsive to changes in unemployment. So just to give you some sense of, of what these facts look like for the United States, here's a graph showing long run inflation expectations um, from the survey of professional forecasters. That's the gray line and core CPI inflation. Um, that's the black line. And you can see that while these moved almost one for one for many periods during the 1980s and early 1990s, by the late 1990s, long run inflation expectations um, had, had actually stabilized. Um, and interestingly, these kinds of facts actually look quite similar both for professional forecasts and for consumer forecasts of longer run inflation. So this is sort of um, some suggested evidence that um, you know, perhaps uh, there is an alternative explanation aside from um, a massive flattening of Phillips curve for why it might be that inflation appears so much less responsive in the recent period. Uh, now, why is it hard to tell apart these different explanations? Um, you know, a massive flattening of the Phillips curve versus, um, you know, this anchored expectation hypothesis that there's this other, other factor that may also be important and which is also moving around in, in the form of long run inflation expectations. Uh, well, a crucial reason and, and something that I'm sure those of you who've worked on trying to estimate the Phillips curve are intensely aware of is that this equation has a lot of endogenous variables in it um, and they're co-moving and it makes it really difficult to tell the difference between these different hypotheses. So one, um, one thing that flows directly from, from my sort of story about the 1980s in the United States is that this was a period in which long run inflation expectations were co-varying pretty strongly with unemployment. And that makes it very hard to tell the difference between a very steep Phillips curve 
and a big decline in long run inflation expectations because both things were happening at the same time. Uh, and you know this is this is natural in a situation where you have uh, a regime change, but it's imperfectly credible. So as a consequence, the regime change is associated with an increase in unemployment. Um, now, you know, this is certainly something where a lot of work has, has, has tried to, in various ways, control for the effects of inflation expectations, uh, but it's very challenging for, um, for econometric reasons. And so this issue of uh, how do you tell the difference between the role of inflation expectations and, um, and, 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 and the slope of the Phillips curve in situations where the, the two things, unemployment, the unemployment gap and long run inflation expectations may be correlated is one of the challenges, uh, the very important challenges that researchers face when trying to estimate the slope of the Phillips curve. A second issue is sort of the classic problem that one always encounters in trying to um, estimate the slope of one equation when the data that you're seeing are coming from a system of equations. So um, the most familiar example of this um, is sort of the Econ 101 uh, example of demand and supply curves. If you're seeing um, prices and quantities and they come from some market, uh, then it's going to be hard to tell whether you're tracing out the demand curve, you're tracing out the supply curve, or you're looking at some kind of mishmash of both. And that challenge also arises in the context of Phillips curve estimation. So while I've been emphasizing the idea that we're, we're, we would like to estimate the, um, the slope of the Phillips curve, so that's the coefficient on this um, demand shock term, um, there can also be supply shocks which shift around the Phillips curve. And that clearly complicates uh, the estimation of the, of the slope of the Phillips curve. Um, and in fact, some of the recent research uh, in this area, so um, both a paper by Fitzgerald and Nicolini and a more recent paper by McLean and Tenreiro have emphasized that, at least in simple models, this problem can sort of be arbitrarily bad, uh, in the sense that in simple models, monetary policy has the ability to completely offset um, all demand shocks. And you know, in that simple world, the only variation that's left in inflation is variation associated with supply shocks. So that's exactly the wrong kind of variation for estimating the slope of the Phillips curve. Um, so potentially this kind of endogeneity problem can be can be arbitrarily bad. So these are some really important empirical challenges, and I, and I think this speaks to why it is that even uh, with a long and venerable history, um, you know we're still we're still struggling with uh, trying to really understand the um, the empirical facts about the Phillips curve. So in this context, the natural question to ask is whether it would be possible to expand the, the set of data that we can use to estimate the Phillips curve, because there's just so much going on in the aggregate data that it's hard to tell the difference between these different effects. So one way of expanding the scope of data that we can, we can potentially use is to look at cross-sectional data. And a recent literature has indeed tried to do this. Um, so, so going back to this um, paper by Fitzgerald and, and Nicolini, and then you know several other important papers that have followed up on that, um, a number of papers have tried to ask this question of whether we can uh, get more out of the data by trying to use not just aggregate evidence on inflation and unemployment, but also evidence from smaller geographical units. And one of the things that um, that some of these papers have emphasized um, is is this idea that I just mentioned that potentially this could help with um, the endogeneity of unemployment rate, this issue of demand and supply shocks that I just mentioned. Because while it's true that in at least a very simple model, it's possible uh, for monetary policy to completely offset all demand shocks, leaving only variation associated with supply shocks to estimate the slope of the Phillips curve, which again is exactly the wrong kind of variation. This would never be possible at the regional level. At the regional level, you know, if you think about California and New York, since there's only one interest rate for the whole United States, you're never going to be able to offset all demand shocks in both states at the same time, and there's going to be some demand variation left over. So that, you know, offers a hope that you could at least do a little bit better in terms of identifying the reaction to demand shocks as opposed to supply shocks. So that's one potential advantage of, um, of, of trying to estimate these equations using regional data. Um, we're going to emphasize another advantage, which has to do with um, expectations. So another advantage is that long-run inflation expectations, at least um, in times of big regime change, like um, the period after 
the, um, the Volcker disinflation are going to tend to move uh, together um, across, um, across different regions uh, or different states in the United States. So, so this is true in the data, you know, but it's also what you would think in a simple model. Um, you know, in, in a simple model, you're all in the same country, you're in a monetary union, and the central bank is setting long-run inflation, uh, the, the inflation target, not just for one state, but for the whole country. And so this is going to mean that long-run inflation expectations um, are common across different states within the union. And from an empirical standpoint, that has the advantage that we can sort of difference out the effect of these long-run inflation expectations using time-fixed events. Um, so this is going to be a sort of dip and dip uh, approach to estimating the slope of the Phillips curve. For those of you who are familiar with that, um, with that language, if you're if you're not, I'm going to go through exactly what I mean. Now there are some uh, very important questions that arise uh, when when thinking about you know how to relate um, the slope of the regional Phillips curve to the slope of the aggregate Phillips curve because it's really not obvious at all um, how they're related. And in fact, there's been a broader discussion in macroeconomics about you know when and to what extent we can use evidence from cross-sectional data to really answer the questions that we are interested in uh, as macroeconomists. And and again, you know, I want to emphasize this is you know, not often not obvious and per, per, perhaps uh, particularly not obvious in the case of uh, inflation, because, um, you know, when we think about uh, regional Phillips curves, we're, we're talking about relative prices, whereas at the aggregate level, you know, we might imagine that we're not talking about relative prices. So it's, it's natural to kind of immediately wonder, uh, you know, how, how these objects are really going to be related, a regional Phillips curve and an aggregate Phillips curve. So that's going to be another dimension on which we're going to try to contribute by developing a sort of simple benchmark model in which you can see exactly what the relationship is between the slope of the regional Phillips curve and the slope of the region uh, of the aggregate Phillips curve. And in fact, we're going to show that the regional Phillips curve slope is going to be very informative about the slope of the aggregate Phillips curve. Uh, another, um, another thing we're going to do is to try to develop some data to actually estimate regional Phillips curves uh, for the United States. This is a little bit of an idiosyncrasy of the US statistical system that historically um, inflation indexes were not released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics at the state level. This has to do with concerns that they've had about sampling error and you know, how users might interpret noisy series. Um, but in any case, historically it wasn't possible to download these kinds of data series, even though the underlying microdata were actually there. And so we're going to construct those series, and our hope is that uh, those data will be useful uh, for projects beyond ours. Uh, but the, these might be issues that are, um, are, are less, less of a problem in, in some other countries where the data infrastructure is somewhat different. And then finally, this regional data is going to give us new, uh, new possibilities for identification. So we're going to construct a new instrument to try to focus on demand variation at the state level and estimate the slope of this regional Phillips curve. So just to preview um, the results, our, our main finding is that we're going to estimate um, a fairly modest slope of the Phillips curve, even going back to the late 1970s, um, modest in the sense that if we plug this slope into, um, you know, if we, if we use this slope that we estimate for the 1970s and 1980s to sort of simulate inflation responses in the modern world to unemployment changes like the unemployment that occurred during the Great Recession, we're actually going to um, predict relatively small movements in inflation, sort of similar to what we saw in the actual data. So in that sense, um, these, these, these slopes are consistent with uh, the fairly modest responsiveness of inflation to unemployment that we've seen in the recent period. So how is this consistent with what happened in the Volcker disinflation when we saw a huge response of inflation to um, increases in unemployment? The way it's consistent is, is, is because, um, according to our estimates, the majority of the decline in inflation that occurred in that period uh, was really a consequence of changes in long run inflation expectations. So this regime change idea. We do find some flattening of the Phillips curve, I should say, um, between the early and the later parts of our sample, but it's not um, quantitatively important in, in explaining, uh, change, you know, explaining basically the, the behavior of inflation because the slope is already quite small. So now let me talk a little bit more about what I mean when I talk about uh, the effects of expectations on inflation 
versus the, the, the slope of the Phillips curve? Because I think this can be a little bit of a confusing statement, given that these are all endogenous objects. Perhaps you're thinking, what do I really mean when I say that um, you know, expectations might have a separate effect on, um, on inflation from um, a demand shock, given that if there is a demand shock, then there's going to be an effect on expectations. So these things are jointly determined. Can we really think of these as separate forces? And, and I think that's, that's exactly a, a reasonable concern to have. Um, and so let me do a little bit of an algebra that can allow us to, to come up with an equation where it's easier to, to see the, the, the separate and distinct role of these different forces. So in particular, I'm going to do a little bit of algebra by, by just solving for it this uh, first um, New Keynesian Phillips curve equation. This is the same equation I showed you at the beginning with inflation on the left-hand side and then expected inflation and um, unemployment minus the natural rate on the right-hand side. I can solve this forward by recursively substituting inflation into inflation expectations on the right-hand side. And then I get this equation, uh, which gives in inflation as a discounted present value of future unemployment. So this is pretty intuitive. It's saying that inflation today isn't just determined by unemployment today, it's, it's determined by people's views about um, unemployment going forward. But now I'm going to do one more thing, which is to decompose unemployment into two components, a um, long run unemployment component, and then a deviation from this long run value, um, U tilde. So now, um, again, not, not doing anything complicated, but just substituting in this decomposition into this discounted present value of future unemployment, I get two terms, one reflecting uh, the discounted present value of cyclical unemployment and the other reflecting um, long run unemployment. And then one last step is to use um, the fact that in the New Keynesian Phillips curve, there is a relationship between long run unemployment and long run inflation. If I substitute in that relationship, then I get this equation at the bottom, uh, which I think is, is pretty intuitive. So if you look at this equation, what it's saying is that inflation is going to move one for one with beliefs about long run uh, inflation in the future. So think about this as the inflation target of the central bank. So this is sort of the, the lesson that you, know, you might have been taught in intermediate macro that um, that if if the central bank commits to um, a very different long run inflation target, that can have a big effect on current inflation. And in addition to this long run inflation expectations term, there's this discounted present value of cyclical unemployment. So this is the, the slope of the Phillips curve that I've been talking about all along. Um, and it's and it's, you know, it's a discounted present value of of a of, of future cyclical unemployment because it doesn't just matter what unemployment is today it also matters uh, what it's going to be, say, over the next few years. So one more, um, one more thing I'm going to do for expositional purposes. Uh, this is not something that we actually use in our analysis, but it's sort of useful just to, just to get intuition for these equations. Um, so suppose that I, we were to assume that unemployment, cyclical unemployment, followed an AR1 process. Then we could solve out for this um, infinite sum using you know, a standard formula for an infinite sum to get this last equation. So this last equation really sort of looks similar to something you could estimate in the data. On the left-hand side, you have inflation. On the right-hand side, you have, um, you have unemployment, uh, cyclical unemployment multiplied by this, um, by this psi term. And then you have these long-run inflation expectations on the right-hand side as well. So a few things to say uh, about this equation here. Um, one comment, um, as I kind of emphasized, is that this long run inflation target um, is a major determinant of current inflation. It has a coefficient of one. Um, so current inflation moves one for one with, um, with this long run inflation target term. Um, and this is true regardless of what the slope of the Phillips curve is. So the slope of the Phillips curve can be very small and yet the response to this long run inflation expectations term can be very high. And you can see how this can be a very fundamental empirical challenge because it means that potentially inflation can move um, you know, in response to this long run inflation expectations term, even without any movement in the cyclical unemployment term. And so potentially if there is a correlation between the cyclical unemployment term and long run inflation expectations that can pose um, you know, a, a major empirical challenge. And that's sort of what I'm arguing happened um, during, during the Great Recession. And it was very hard to tell the difference between these two factors because it was both true 
that cyclical unemployment rose a lot and also true that the long run inflation target uh, fell considerably. So potentially this is a very important source of omitted variables bias. So now um, let me move on to a model where we can think about how this aggregate, this kind of um, aggregate uh, Phillips curve formulation relates to what we might get um, using regional data and how to interpret these things from a structural standpoint. So the model is going to be very standard, sort of a type of model that you've probably mostly seen many, many times before, um, except it's going to have these uh, multiple regions. So there'll be two, multiple, two, two regions. Each has a tradable and non-tradable sector. Um, there's no labor mobility between regions, but there's perfect labor mobility between sectors within each region. And then most importantly, there's a monetary union uh, between uh, these, which, which encompasses these two regions. So that's going to be important because it means that uh, for example, the inflation target will be common across the two regions. Um, so very standard assumptions um, on the household and firm side. Um, you know, there's CES demand on the household side. There's uh, Calvo um, price setting um, with perhaps the, the, the one exception of, of GHH preferences on the household side. Um, now, in all of this, we're sort of making some starkly simplest, simple assumptions um, the, the logic for that is that I'm going to show you a benchmark case in which the relationship between the aggregate and, and regional Phillips curve is going to be particularly stark and simple. But of course, um, you know, I think it would be interesting to think about, um, you know, generalizing these assumptions among, uh, along various dimensions. So what do you get out of this? Um, so uh, the aggregate Phillips curve, which is the second equation here, is the same as what I've been showing you all along. So this is just the, the new Keynesian Phillips curve. Um, but we also can derive a regional Phillips curve for non-tradables, and that's going to look very similar to the aggregate Phillips curve, except it's going to have this additional term, um, which, you know, I can call a terms of trade term, um, has to do with the relative prices um, between tradables and non-tradables. And intuitively, um, this is going to be the thing that's going to bring you back to PPP in the long run. So it, it's actually not going to be very important from an empirical standpoint. Uh, in practice, we're going to estimate the coefficient on this term as being quite small, um, and that's related to the fact that we have a pretty flat Phillips curve that we're estimating, but it's going to be quite important from a theoretical standpoint in terms of just thinking about how you get determinacy in this model. The other thing that I want to highlight is that in this simple model, and again, you know, we have made a number of sort of stark simplifying assumptions, the, the slope, the coefficient on um, unemployment here is uh, kappa in both cases, it's the same. Um, so, so this is sort of the basis for the statement that at least in this simple model, you can learn a lot about the slope of the aggregate Phillips curve from looking at the slope of the regional Phillips curve. Now notice that um, I'm talking about non-tradables here. Um, that's something that comes out of the model, but it's also very intuitive. Um, the intuition is that if you think about tradables, like think of gasoline, if you consider running a regional Phillips curve regression with time fixed effects, what's going to happen? Well, if the gasoline prices are the same across all the regions, then the time fixed effect will absorb all the variation in the gasoline prices and the coefficient on local unemployment will be zero. And that would be true um, regardless of how responsive um, gasoline prices truly are to economic conditions. Um, and you're, you, you know, you're just getting that zero on local unemployment because of the fact that gasoline is priced nationally as, as opposed to being priced locally. So that's the sense in which what you really can learn from these regional Phillips curves uh, pertains to, um, to, to, to goods or services that are priced at the local level. So in most of what we do empirically, we're going to focus on services prices for this reason. Now I'm gonna do a similar sort of solving forward exercise to what I did for the aggregate data, starting with this regional Phillips curve and then solving it forward exactly in the same way as I did with the aggregate uh, data. And so just uh, as before, I'm gonna end up um, with, um, with terms that are discounted present values of cyclical unemployment and a long run inflation expectations term. Um, empirically, um, this long run inflation expectations term is going to be proxied for by time fixed effects in the data. Now, one more time, if we just for expositional purposes, suppose we were to assume that um, the cyclical unemployment process followed an error one 
then we could solve out for this discount, this, uh, this infinite sum um, using, you know, standard formulas, and, um, and we would get this equation, which actually looks a lot like what people have estimated in the data uh, in this regional Phillips curves literature. So this equation here has inflation on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, it has unemployment um, multiplied by psi, and then it has the terms of trade terms. So that often hasn't been included. As, as I said, empirically, it's, it's not so important, but, but theoretically, it is important to make the model sort of make sense. Then we have a time fixed effect and a supply shock term. Now, the one thing I want to highlight here is that the coefficient on cyclical unemployment uh, here is psi and not kappa. Psi and kappa are closely related. So here's the formula for psi in terms of kappa, but they're not the same. And the crucial difference between them is that uh, psi is kappa adjusted for the persistence of the unemployment rate. So remember that this term here, it comes from kappa multiplied by discounted present sum of uh, discounted present value of future unemployment rates. And so the issue is that, um, that the, the, the response to unemployment today in this kind of solve forward version of the Phillips curve, it's not just a response to current economic conditions. It's also a response to the fact that unemployment is a very persistent variable. So if unemployment is high today, you expect it to stay, home, stay high, you know, probably at least for a couple of years. And as a consequence, uh, the coefficient on current unemployment is gonna be much higher than just kappa. It's, it's going to need to be kappa adjusted for the persistence of the unemployment rate. The reason I'm belaboring this point, which is sort of a point about arithmetic, is that from an applied standpoint, um, many of the specifications people have estimated for regional Phillips curve really are estimates which pertain to psi and not kappa. So that is an issue in terms of relating the estimates from the regional Phillips curve literature to the estimates from the aggregate literature, which would focus more on kappa. And there's this sense that estimates for the regional Phillips curve literature tend to yield higher slope uh, parameters than estimates from the aggregate Phillips curve literature. And our sense is that um, a considerable amount of this difference can be accounted for by this, um, by this sort of mechanical issue, that the regional Phillips curve literature tends to be estimating psi, whereas the aggregate literature, both the theoretical literature and, and the empirical literature is oft often focusing on cap. So it's a it's a sort of a, a mechanical point, but, but one that I think matters for the applied literature. So briefly, um, we construct these new state level inflation indexes um, for the period from 1978 to 2018 um, that we think have a number of advantages relative to the existing data. And we're gonna focus on the behavior of um, state level inflation for non-tradables, um, which is basically gonna be state level inflation for services. Then what's the variation on the right hand side that we're gonna be looking at? Um, well, here's a plot showing unemployment for California, Texas, and Pennsylvania. And so it's gonna be uh, differences in um, state level unemployment that are gonna be contributing to our estimates of the slope of the Phillips curve. So it's gonna be the fact that, for example, Texas has an extra recession in the late um, 1980s, you know, presumably having to do with the fact that it's an oil state, or the fact that California has a much um, bigger increase in unemployment associated with the Great Recession. So these are going to be the kinds of differences across states that will help identify um, the slope of the regional Phillips curve, because as I said, it's going to be sort of a diff and diff type of estimate. So what do we get um, out of this? Um, well, um, let me just repeat here our, our regional Phillips curve. Um, so now, as I've sort of um, alluded to earlier, we're not going to use this AR1 uh, assumption in our actual estimates, although I think it's useful expositionally. So I'm, here I'm just writing out the infinite sums, no, um, no, no solving for these with, with the assumption of AR1. Um, although to, to, to compare it to the prior literature, we're also going to consider this kind of specification, which you could get by making this AR1 uh, assumption. Um, so this is, this is the, the type of equation that we're going to want to estimate, and we're going to use a fairly standard sort of GMM approach uh, to do it. What about identification? So there's this issue of demand versus supply shocks that I've emphasized, and it's an important challenge. So here Amy, we're going to... I mean, you have five ahead. minutes. You have five okay. minutes. Just to look Sounds good. So here we're going to use two different approaches. 
One, um, we're, we're, we're just going to sort of rely on the time fixed effects to capture the supply shocks um, and, and use lagged unemployment and relative price instruments. The second approach is this new tradable demand instrument that is going to be sort of a new feature that we can rely on from the, from the regional data. So while I don't have time to go into the details of this tradable demand spillover instrument, uh, for those of you who are familiar with, with, with this idea, it's kind of similar to a Bartik instrument um, that we're going to use to construct proxies for demand shocks at the local level. So we're going to estimate this structural equation uh, for the Phillips curve using these two approaches, um, either um, OLS um, or, um, or, this, or this instrument. So I, I, I mix that, that up a little bit. It's, it's GMM that we're going to use to estimate kappa here. But we also, as I said, for similarity to the existing literature, we have this type of reduced form, this, this type of reduced form equation. And here we're going to be using um, similar instruments, but just estimating this reduced form equation. So what do we what do we get out of this? Well, a first conclusion is that it really matters to include time fixed effects. So when we don't include time fixed effects, then we actually get basically a slope of zero for these regional uh, for these regional Phillips curves. Uh, when we do include time fixed effects, however, um, you know, we get, you know, considerably statistically significant um, uh, slopes on the, on the Phillips curve. And, um, and, and so, you, again, you should think about the inclusion of these time fixed effects as picking up the role of these long run inflation expectations. Now, perhaps more interesting than the slope of the Phillips curve over the whole time period is this question of how it's changed. When we don't include time fixed effects, focusing on kappa, which is the estimate of the structural slope of the Phillips curve, then we get a massive flattening of the Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve appears to flatten, you know, by a factor of, of, um, of 100. Um, on the other hand, when we do include time fixed effects, um, we get a much more modest flattening. So now if you look at this, um, this row here, the Phillips curve uh, flattens from, from a slope of about 0.01 to a slope of about 0.005. And the results are quite similar using our two identification approaches, either lagged unemployment or using this new instrument that we construct using the regional data. It's maybe easier to kind of uh, understand this in, in, in pictures. Um, so the version on the left-hand side is showing the relationship between inflation and unemployment um, when uh, we don't include time fixed effects. And there you see a, a tremendously different relationship um, in the first part of the sample period before 1990, where it looks quite steep, and the second part after 1990, where it looks almost completely flat. In contrast, once you take out time fixed effects, then while you do see some flattening between the first part of the sample period and the second part of the sample period, it's much more modest. And so there's this really dramatic effect of controlling for time fixed effects, which on our model are proxying for changes in long run inflation expectations. So now um, to ask the question of, of how um, steep our estimates of the Phillips curve really are, um, a, a sort of useful exercise is to take our estimates from these cross-sectional Phillips curves and then just plug in the aggregate data and then ask um, if we use our estimates of the slope of the Phillips curve uh, and of, of kappa and then plug in aggregate unemployment data, what would um, our estimates imply for uh, variation in inflation in the recent period? And, and, and would, the, would the variation be, um, be too large or too small? Um, so this is what we do. I'm not going to go through all of the details, although I do want to say that it's fairly important that we're going to do the same thing that we do for non-tradables, also for, uh, for rent, because the the shelter component, the housing component of the CPI is one of the most cyclical components, as some of you may know. So we're going to do a similar exercise for rent, and the estimates I'll show you will be including the housing component. So here's what we get from that analysis. The gray line here is the prediction uh, from just this fitted equation where we take our slope of the regional Phillips curve and plug in the aggregate data. And the black line is the actual data. Um, so the first um, thing I want to um, say is that both um, lines are taking out the rule of long run inflation expectations. So what I'm plotting here is inflation minus long run inflation expectations. And once you do that, the amplitude of both lines is much diminished. So notice that in most cases, um, 
the, the, the data on inflation minus long run inflation expectations, it doesn't vary by more than 1%. So that's the first comment that, um, that most of the variation that we see in inflation um, is associated with variation in long run inflation expectations. A second comment is that there's actually pretty reasonable co movement between um, the predictions um, of, you know, based on our regional Phillips curve data which is the, the gray line and the, the black line uh, for the period since 1990. And that just reflects the fact that inflation has tended to fall um, during recessions and has tended to rise during booms, um, just not by very much. The period when actually um, there's the biggest disconnect between um, the predictions based on the regional Phillips curve analysis and, and the actual data is the period around 1980. And a natural interpretation of that is that this, this set of predictions I'm showing you is a set of predictions if there were only demand shocks. And I think it's natural to think that you need supply shocks to explain the period around 1980. Um, but there's a sense in which this is kind of the opposite of the conventional wisdom in, in the sense that, you know, actually our analysis is pretty consistent with the period since 1990. It's, it's really the period around 1980 where you need something like supply shocks to explain the data. So let me say one more thing. Um, before I kind of conclude here, which is that uh, my analysis has really been putting a lot of emphasis on the role of long run inflation expectations, which in the empirical work is proxied for by these time fixed effects. Um, but I really haven't said anything interesting about how they would determine. I know uh, that in this conference, a number of you have been kind of uh, commenting on these issues. I think this is an incredibly important issue. Um, it's you know a very important question: how the monetary authority can change people's beliefs about long run inflation expectations. Um, and even though, you know, there's been quite a bit of work on this in economics, um, I, I, I think it remains something that we don't understand very well and something that um, that where, where more research is, is very welcome. Uh, because we know that there are many times when people don't seem to adjust at all in terms of their long run beliefs about inflation, but other times it seems that these beliefs do um, adjust rapidly. Um, so examples would be the end of the Volcker, dis the Volcker disinflation, which I just showed you, but also the end of hyperinflations. Um, so, you know, in the case of the Volcker disinflation, um, you know, how did it happen? Do I think it was an accident uh, that inflation expectations fell so rapidly during this recession? Um, you know, probably not. Um, politics were probably very important. Um, there was the fact that there was this massive uh, recession and yet Volcker uh, didn't get fired. And perhaps this was really crucially important in uh, changing beliefs about the long-run monetary machine. But at the same time, I think that's a fundamentally different mechanism from the conventional mechanism of a steep Phillips curve, where you're holding the monetary machine constant. So let me stop there, um, and, and I'm, I'm, I would be very open to any, any questions and comments. Thank you, Wami. Uh, thank you for the very nice presentation. Um, I am still waiting. Uh, people can uh, post the, the, the questions in the chat. I actually have one question uh, myself. So um, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, one of the great thing about this paper is really uh, the fact that uh, you managed to explain um, what we do when we do this uh, uh, regional uh, estimation of Phillips scores. But, you know, I have to say the truth. I mean, really in the literature, I, I like those estimations, but I didn't fundamentally understand them. And you know, thanks to your paper, I guess we have a much better insight. Um, one aspect uh, that comes from your model is the fact that uh, you know you can get rid of these uh, inflation expectations by the time fixed effect but that's also you know coming from a relatively simple theory and you know i was also thinking that uh, you know when you think about uh, what happens empirically it might be that uh, there is a secular component uh, in you know in, in unemployment in different states which can differ a lot across states uh, that would challenge your, your assumption that you can get rid of that term. So how do we think in those terms? Do you have uh, any insight yeah, yeah, into that? It's a, it's a very good question. So um, let me say first that just in terms of what the data look like, um, you might be surprised by how much co-movement there is um, across states in um, people's inflation expectations and particularly the long-run inflation expectations. And... Uh, particularly with regard to a big event such as the Volcker disinflation. So in terms of, you know, how the data look, just in terms of like some first reaction that one might have, um, there, there is a lot of co-movement uh, and, and, you know, that kind of lines up with what you might expect from the data. But just to respond to your bigger conceptual point, which I think is an important one, yes, absolutely, there could be, um, you know, 
reasons for secular changes in inflation in one state versus another. And basically that would introduce an error term, which you know, we didn't have in our model. And then that becomes um, an issue of identification. And that becomes where um, you know, the instruments uh, become important. So then the question essentially is whether um, the, the variation associated with these secular changes that might be leading to different long-run inflation um, expectations or long-run inflation in different states is correlated with the source of variation that the instruments are picking up. So just to give a concrete example so we can think about this a little more easily, imagine that there's some state like Florida, which has an aging population relative to some other states which don't have this aging population. So that might have some impact on relative inflation rates, perhaps because of different consumption baskets or something like that. Then the question effectively, so that's gonna introduce basically some component of the error term, which has to do with demographics. And then the question of whether that would bias our estimates is essentially one of whether that component of the error term would be correlated with the instrument. And so I think our hope is that, you know, our instruments are sort of picking up more kind of cyclical variation um, that wouldn't be associated with these type of long-term secular trends. And so, you know, we would hope that, um, that, 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 that it wouldn't be a source of bias, but I think that's the way to think about it. That, you know, you could think about adding more error terms associated with the kind of issues you're describing, and I'm sure they're there. Um, and, then, and then it really just becomes a question of, of whether um, those, 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 those sources of the error terms are, are correlated with the source of identification we're using to estimate the slope of the curve. Thank you. Sounds yeah, indeed, sounds a very interesting uh, thing to, to look at. And uh, I see now that there is a question in the chat by Peter Karadi, but I think that essentially he was asking something very similar to what I asked. So let me uh, read it out. Um, very insightful presentation. I see the theoretical point about how regional estimation can help eliminating long-term inflation expectations. Are there evidence about regional known variability in measured long-term inflation expectations? What might be particularly interesting, whether regional long-term expectations are influenced by regional as opposed to national uh, activity and inflation? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And we've actually only recently been kind of looking at this. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have anything sort of formally written out, but we've been looking at this a little bit because, you know, exactly, it, it is a good question. And our initial impression is that it is actually remarkable how much core movement there is in these regional um, inflation expectations. So it appears um, that, um, that, that people are thinking a lot about, um, uh, about the same factors in different states in, in forming their long run inflation expectations. The data aren't, aren't great, but they're, you know, for the United States, you, you, don't, you can't get it at the state level, but at the regional level, you can get uh, some information about inflation expectations. And that's what I'm basing that statement on. But I, I, I think that would be very interesting to study more. Thank you. I see now another question came in um, by Hassan Natusi. Um, correcting the regional estimate PSI for the persistence of unemployment requires an assumption about how forward-looking firms are. We know from the forward guidance literature that the new, new Keynesian Phillips School is too forward-looking. Could we possibly draw different conclusions from a model where firms are not as forward looking? Yeah, that's a that's a, a great question. Um, something I didn't really have time to comment on, but you know, you, you could you could say there's a little bit of a, a tension in, in some sense in the fact that I'm uh, I am using this um, this sort of solving forward to convert between psi and kappa. Uh, that's the one place where we're sort of explicitly in some sense using rational expectations. One um, comment I would make is that the, the way that we're using rational expectations is really just in, in people kind of knowing how long the recession is going to last. So, you know, as, as a first kind of comment, I think that it is much easier to be rational about the idea that you think that on average you're in a recession now, you're going to be in a recession for the, you know, at least the next few years. That's an easier way to be rational than, um, for example, to be rational about the future distribution of of the inflation target or something like that, just because you, you know you have more sort of experience with that type of episode. So that's that's the first comment. But we have been very concerned with the issue that you described. So we've actually um, redone our analysis for various different values of beta, um, the, the discount rate 
And, you know, there is quite a bit of robustness in terms of the findings and in response to, you know, different values of this data. So it's not, it's not super sensitive to that. Um, that was something we were concerned about for the reasons you described. Um, you know, that said, I, I think um, this question of, of, of how, you know, how you might interpret these facts in the context of a, of a less rational model is a very interesting and reasonable one to ask. The good thing about our analysis is that aside from this issue you're pointing to about the relationship between beta and kappa, other than that, you know, we're taking out the long run inflation expectations term. So how that gets formed and how rational it is in some sense becomes a moot point. And in that sense, you know, we're putting a lot less weight on rational expectations than in, in other estimation approaches. Um, but, but you're right that in the relationship between Kappa and, and Psi, you know, intuitively, um, that conversion depends on how long people expect the recession to last. And to the, to the extent that they think it's going to last, you know, they're going to end right away or something like that, that's going to lead to a different implication for the, for the structural parameter. Um, than, uh, than, than if they're more rational about that duration. So I, I think it's a very, you know, interesting question where, where certainly more could be done. Great. So, Emmy, thank you very much uh, for the insightful presentation and uh, the nice Q&A. Uh, really happy uh, to have you here.